So, then the chapter goes on, and the second section of the chapter goes straight into, um, not a period, angular momentum. And angular momentum is a vector, actually. And the way you calculate the angular momentum of something is you first have to choose a sort of a center or a reference place or point, and you go out to the, the massive particle whose angular momentum you want to describe. So this marks the location of the uh, particle relative to your chosen center, um, and you vector cross product with the momentum of that particle. So this is something that you would have learned in 4A. Um, yeah, it's a cross product thing, so it's like a three-dimensional type of quantity because this little cross product is a 3D vector operation. Um, yeah, so it's very vectory, very right-hand rule and all that stuff. Um, so Bohr his whole um, model of the hydrogen atom that was extremely successful, actually, Bohr's quantization model uh, for the hydrogen atom, um, it, it reproduced a lot of um, emission spectrum data, like the Balmer series and the Lyman and Passion series for hydrogen. The truth is, is Bohr's model um, uh, predicted, uh, had predictive power in that world. Um, so even though it solved that emission problem nearly exactly, uh, it still had some really, really big time uh, problems. In, um, in particular, so Bohr, what he did was he went and he said that the angular momentum of the atom is quantized but the value, the quantum number, uh, which is related to the energy of the atom, which is the whole basis for this uh, photon emission model and you know solving the problem, it hinged on the fact that n had to be an integer that started from the number one. So, so n could not be zero. That is, L could never be zero. So what this means is that the atom only ever has uh, angular momentum. Um, so this is an interesting point. So L can never be zero. So the atom has a sense of spinning uh, in it that's permanent. Um, you can never have none of that. None, none of it. Um, so anyways, I, I mean, it could have been that, well, maybe that's just the way nature is, but, but another problem with Bohr is it really is only two dimensional. So Bohr's world of the atom really did collapse down into a two dimensional model of the atom. I mean, it is true that you could imagine, okay, so this atom is oriented this way in two dimensions and this other atom is oriented this way or that way or that way. So, I mean, maybe you could still play up uh, Bohr's quantization model, even though it's really at heart, it's a 2D thing. But angular momentum really is this 3D kind of thing. And the electron, you know, you're, you're learning that uh, it's hard to say what it's, um, for example, its position and momentum at the same time are, so that's an interesting construction out of two things that are, um, that are kind of like incompatibly exactly knowable at the same time. Um, anyhow, so Schrodinger, when you sit down to model uh, of the three-dimensional right so including this 3d thing so schrodinger model of the 3d classical atom so where you have a nucleus and the electron could be here or there or there or behind over here could have momentum this way or that way or that way 
Um, right, so fully 3D, unrestricted to 2D at all. So fully 3D uh, predicts different um, different things for L. And this is what the second section of the book explores. Um, in particular, uh, here are some crazy things that the book says. So L is going to have a magnitude. So this is the prediction of the 3D Schrodinger equation. Um, it's equal to the square root of some integer L times the very same integer plus 1. And this is got to have physical dimensions of angular momentum. So it's just multiplied on h bar. h bar is an angular momentum. Um, it's got units of angular momentum uh, where L can take quantum values or integer values starting actually at 0. 1, 2, on and on. Um, there actually is an upper bound. So I'll just draw a slash upper bound. And I'm going to describe what the upper bound of this series of possible quantum values for this L. So L is called the, um, I always think of it as the total angular momentum quantum number. So L is the total angular momentum quantum number and actually I'm, I'm rethinking this I, I don't think we should call it total uh, you'll see I think it's it, it's actually something addressed in chapter 8 um, so in, anyhow let, let's just call it angular momentum quantum number that's what the book says um, but it turns out that the quantum mechanics of angular momentum in the Schrodinger 3D atom doesn't have just one quantum number. It actually has two quantum numbers. So the, the vector angular momentum, L, uh, we would write it down as Lxi hat plus Lyj hat plus Lz k hat, where Lx, Ly, and Lz are the components of the angular momentum vector. But it turns out that Lz is special. And I'll explain why I'm putting special in quotes, because the truth is, is Lz is not more special than Ly or Lx. It cannot be. Um, yeah, uh, we really like the idea that space is isotropic. It looks the same in all directions. So really, LZ is not special, but it is kind of treated specially. And, and so it's given a quantum number that's associated with LZ. So the Z component of angular momentum is a different integer multiplying the quantity H bar. But check this out. M sub L is an integer that's either positive or negative. And it takes values from, uh, so let me finish this, all the way up to, so it's bounded at the top, by L. So it takes, M sub L takes integer values starting from L, and then goes down to L minus 1, down through 0 to minus 1, down all the way down to minus L for 2L plus 1 different values, which speaks to degeneracy. Um, so possible degeneracy in energy. Um, so this, this is a, a way for, you know, it's counting. Um, but anyhow, so right now, this is a big deal. And this is a big deal. So not only do we have an expression for the z component of angular momentum, which can take positive or negative integer amounts of h-bar, so angular momentum in the z direction is quantized, and then the, um, the total angular momentum vector itself is quantized in this interesting way. So 
I'm going to put in a plug for you to go read. So I'm just going to show you a picture. And the picture is, here's a page out of your book. So there's this um, really interesting thing right here that describes um, what I call, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to write in my book, but this right here is often referred to as space quantization. I'd like you to go and read about why there are these arrows and there's only, for example, five of them. So there's five here related to that number 2L plus 1. Um, so these five vectors and uh, you could even think about some of the description that's going on right here in the top of this paragraph in this weird angle theta. Oh yeah, here it actually says it. So um, this behavior represents a curious aspect of quantum mechanics called spatial quantization. I, I called it space quantization, but anyhow. Um, and then you can go and you can read about angular momentum uncertainty, which kind of looks like instead of uncertainty in x, uncertainty in p, it's uncertainty in angle, but it's this azimuth angle, azimuthal, phi, and uncertainty in the z component of angular momentum. So pretty strange, interesting uncertainty principle.